Hello everyone. Um, bringing performance um, is sometimes about reshaping um, investment in portfolio, reshaping LBO, reshaping companies. Um, this panel is about steering and operating um, strategic transformation, whether in LBO, somehow stable companies, but also distressed companies. Um, so together with us, we have, we have uh, Tristan Nackler, Managing Director at Aurelius. We have Gilles Colombin, partner and head of IR at Charterhouse Capital Partners. We have Adrian Ashley Jones, uh, CCO at Intuitus Advisory. And we have also two experts and uh, private equity fund uh, manager in restructuring situation, Sébastien Gauthier, uh, with me in Paris at Alandia Industry, That's and Vincent idea. Fami, Managing Director at, at Verdozo. So, um, yeah, that's good. We're on the same boat. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, so, um, Tristan, um, I'd like to start with you. Um, the first topic will be about steering transformation in uh, portfolio companies in, um, in private equity. Um, can you share with us a few a trick of the trade for you? You've made your reputation uh, by uh, being more hands on than many funds. Um, so how do you operate uh, the transformation? Is it the management team who does the work? Is it your team that does the work? Tristan? Can you hear me? Not sure they can hear us. Can you hear us? Okay. So one, the technical team will help us. Um, I'll turn to uh, Sébastien. Uh, the, the other topic um, is um, taking companies which are in distress situation and moving them from, from a loss-making situation to a stabilized uh, situation. What are your lessons from more than 10 years uh, turning around companies? Oh, but maybe I will just answer your first question. Um, well, what's very difficult when you uh, take over a company is to have the right management team to do the job. What is specific about uh, turning around company is that you need to have a management team that is both an industry expert, but at the same time is really driving transformation. It's very difficult to find someone who has both expertise. So typically at Alandia Industries, the way we do it is that we keep the management team. Uh, we don't do what people learn you to do, which is put the right person at the right place at the right time. We prefer to keep the management team and let them focus on what they are good at, meaning driving the business. And we come with them to really drive the transformation ourselves. Uh, what, is, what really requires um, specificities is that uh, you need to be compatible, compatible with the management team. It means that at all time, we really make sure that the management team fit with us. Uh, and if the management team doesn't feel comfortable with us, we will let them alone and we will not invest. Um, the last thing I think which is uh, uh, very interesting is that uh, by doing, by having this approach, we can plug in into the company for one, two years, sometimes three years, really driving the transformation. And at the same time, uh, when the transformation is done and when you are going back to a more development approach, the management team uh, will continue on his own and will help you uh, sell the company to the next investor for the next value creation. Thanks. Uh, Vincent, what's your playbook about putting them from uh, loss-making situation to uh, stable operating conditions? The, the, the first job um, uh, before um, purchasing the company is uh, uh, to uh, build uh, what we call a prenup plan uh, prenup plan. A prenup plan, exactly, with the with the management, uh, and and setting up uh, an action plan uh, with uh, very detailed um, uh, operating transformation that's need to be done in the in the company. So you have to craft uh, this plan before buying the the company together with the management. The management uh, has to be in place, uh, 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 not not. Uh, 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 maybe the, the, the top CEO, but you, have, you, you need to find a key guy in the company who uh, is a N minus uh, one person uh, who uh, endorses the, the company, who knows the, the market. And what we bring to this uh, prenup agreement is the 
um, um, a powerful methodology based on uh, project management. Uh, it's a very hands-on approach where we uh, project uh, uh, people from, uh, from our team, uh, people uh, who are in our ecosystem and who will uh, uh, help and, 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 and manage the, the, the project management and the, the change management together with, uh, with the day-to-day the -day, uh, uh, managers of the, of the business. So we have to, to bring this uh, operational team in the, in, the, in the company. We have to uh, uh, craft this plan. And once that is done, we are able to, uh, to purchase the, the company. Um, then we have, once we are in the company, uh, historically we had a free phase uh, company. And what, has, what I've, 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 I've lived through uh, Many over, times. The, yeah, over the last 15 years is that the, this free, t free period uh, um, framework has become a two-period framework. First, when you enter in a, in, in a company that is losing money, you have to uh, 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 bring some positive cash flow. This is the emergency uh, uh, action. So uh, you provide leadership, of course. You secure the financial base. You cut all necessary unnecessary costs. You stop the loss-making uh, uh, sales. Uh, you reduce the capital employed. You re-incentive the management. So this is the first uh, uh, very uh, uh, important task, which is stabilizing and de-risking the investment. Then you have a second phase, which is uh, uh, investing in the future, uh, enhancing profitability. So you have to this phase, which is you know uh, build the management team uh, with incentives, strengthen the the management system. So this is where. You, you, you plan the, the, the IT program, the CapEx program, uh, and uh, you, you, def you determine also new uh, sales area, new, new projects uh, for, the, for the development. And then you have a third phase, uh, which is uh, accelerate, grow the company. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this two phase, which is uh, enhancing profitability and growth, during the last years, uh, you need to to, to, to build them in the same time. You don't have, because you know, we have all the companies from the uh, old world are, are, are a little bit punched by the new business model, people who uh, have uh, less uh, cost of capital than we do. And, uh, and you have to build this, those two approach uh, simultaneously, which means that you have to bring more capital in the, in the, in the companies and that uh, the first cash flows that you will generate are not enough to, uh, to, to, build the, to build the growth. Okay. Um, so this is our approach, and this is what we have done for the last 23 years now. So that's the action plan and the methodology. And now yeah. let's go to case study. Do you want to start, Sebastian? One case study where it was successful. I think Carbon Savoie is maybe a good example. Yeah. It was losing a lot of money. Yes. What happened? Typically, uh, Carbon Savoie was a company that uh, was losing uh, about 20 million euros of EBDA out of a turnover of 60 million. So uh, back in 2016, the previous shareholder was looking at a closure plan. Uh, we jump in and uh, we negotiated uh, the acquisition of that company and led a very, very strong transformation plan, uh, investing more than 40 million euros of CapEx uh, in research and development, productivity, technology, in order to drive a new story. Uh, it's, people have to understand that buying is pretty simple. But buying, then transforming, then selling, make it all very, very complicated. Uh, the transformation is obviously difficult, otherwise everyone would have done it before. But the selling is also very difficult, because when you sell four years after buying a company, you have to explain how the company is different. It can just not be the profitability that is better. It has to be more than that, because people remember the, the bad time situation. So typically, by doing all those investments, by injecting all those cash that Vincent was mentioning, you're able to, to really transform the business model. You're really to transform uh, the company, its market, uh, its investment, its productivity, its competitiveness on the marketplace. And, and then people who were more like natural investors we were not looking at that investment four years earlier or again, ready to look at it. And so typically, if we talk about Carbon Savoie, uh, we start 60 million of turnover 
four years after it was 160 million of turnover. So more than doubled the yeah, revenue. More than doubled the turnover, minus 15% of EBDA, plus 15% of EBDA uh, by the end of the four year period. And a very, very strong transformation will convince someone who will clearly say, I'm not interested in buying this company four years earlier, and that back in July 2020, in the middle of COVID, say it's the right company for me at the right time. Vincent, a case study of success and yeah. maybe also a case study of uh, failure. Yeah. Uh, if you have the guts to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, let, let's talk about the success. It's a different story uh, uh, than, uh, than Sebastian because he made the money by uh, growing the business and bringing new sales and, and bringing new strategies, which, of course, uh, delivers uh, EBITDA. We have another story from uh, Schneider Electric. We bought a company, uh, and, and this is how I, I, man I managed to come with uh, Verdozo. It was a company that had a larger turnover uh, when we bought it than uh, the, the turnover when we sold it. And uh, it's just that um, we, we, we totally changed the approach of the business. It was a, a Schneider company which was willing to uh, be number two or number three in all the areas in the, all, the, uh, all the world. It was a, a company selling um, um, machine um, control uh, uh, and CNC's. Um, and uh, and uh, the, the company had a, a, a very uh, good subsidiary in Switzerland and, uh, and we built the company around this uh, subsidiary and, and streamlined the rest of the company. So the, the sales uh, were 100 million euros in the early uh, 2000 when it was a Schneider company and it ended being a 60 million euros turnover uh, company. However, it was losing money uh, in, uh, 2000, in, uh, in the early 2000 and uh, when we sold it, uh, it was a 20% uh, EBITDA, EBITDA company. So this was, you know, uh, uh, really uh, implementing a, a streamlining and focusing on the on the on the growth and and, and margin uh, important margin uh, business, and of course we we failed uh, at Verdozo. We Sometimes. bought we bought we bought 28 companies over the last 23 uh, 23 years, so it's it's a little bit more than a company per year, and uh, we failed four times. So and you learn a lot about uh, failing, and uh, if I if I uh, call a, a failure. We, we bought out a company um, uh, in the, in the, in the um, uh, Windows business and, and this company we failed because when we bought it at the, at the court in bankruptcy, uh, we didn't have the, the good data and we didn't provide, we didn't have the right analysis uh, crafting the plan. So we were wrong with uh, 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 crafting the plan and, and, and we based our analysis on wrong data. So you need to invest when you buy companies that are in distress, you need to invest a lot in, uh, in due diligence uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, have the right verify, plan. to have the right strategic plan, the right data to build your plan and to, uh, and to build your investment, uh, investment case. So, that's so, you, so you need data and you need doers. So you need data to, to craft the plan and then you need doers and good managers who know the business insider doers inside the company and f and going for the long term it's a, it's a long term business and that's why i think alandia and uh, verdozo proves that uh, you know it's it's this restructuring business in france is more business uh, performed by uh, holding companies that have time that have know how that have knowledge than uh, the the usual funds you know who have to to buy and and to sell we have time to, to sell, you have time to build the companies, and this timing is, is really necessary. Got it. Um, we still have a few technical issues to, uh, to join with, uh, with our other speakers, Tristan and Gilles, as well as uh, Adrian. Are they, are they in? Okay, so let's uh, now switch to uh, a tra strategic transformation in private equity LBO type situation. Uh, Tristan, Tristan, can you hear me? Um, this yeah, I can hear you well. Thanks. So, um, you know, you have uh, Aurelius is known for having a very um, hands-on approach to transformation. Um, can you tell us how you, you structure those transformation, leveraging the managers, but also your operating partners? Yeah, absolutely. So the firm has um, a sizable operational team. Um, and, and look, we do look to work in partnership with the managers. You know, we, we do not want to put our team in to actually manage businesses. We want the, the management to manage the business. But there's always a lot to do in terms of really transforming businesses, requires extra capacity. 
So we set ourselves up to have that sort of capacity. And um, I guess at the beginning, there's an element of design and you know, a thoughtful approach and a, and a patient mindset to how quickly you can make change to make sure that you know, the business continues to service customers, to look after stakeholders as it goes through transformational change. Um, and the idea is that we provide, I guess, extra capacity to, to help you know, drive, drive initiatives um, and you know, having over 80 people in our, in our group that can provide this sort of support means every single business that we have an investment in can benefit from that. Um, and the sort of support we have is, you know, there's general management capability, restructuring capability, but there's also people who only look, at, let's say, look at procurement um, or supply chain or sales force efficiency or IT, uh, IT projects, IT carve outs, this sort of thing. And so these are often competencies that you would not expect, you know, a normal management team to also have. You know, you would expect there to be a supply chain director and a procurement director, but they wouldn't always have the time to, to I guess, really um, rebuild the supply chain and to really reevaluate. And so I guess in the ideal world, you have a business that's very stable and you at the same time look to really drive transformational change um, over, over, over a time frame. So you have about 90 operation, operational professional across Europe. How many plans do you deploy for one company in average? So it's probably about about five or six. At the same time, not phase one, yeah, phase two, phase exactly. three. So you, you're, yeah. you're touching upon five levels of, of performance at the same time uh, as the LBO unfolds, right? Yeah, I think, I think in the initial term, it's about evaluation, diagnostic and understanding, let's say in the first hundred days, you know, where the priorities are, um, you know, where, where actions needed in a real hurry. But I think the hope is over, let's say, two years, you know, you're impacting change in an awful lot of areas. You're obviously you're doing it sometimes sequentially because, as I said, it's really important that you don't overwhelm the business with too much initiative and change at the same time. Um, but you obviously want to, want to sort of go early in particular areas. Um, and I, I would say typically, you know, we, we, when we're going through strategic transformation and not also, let's say, chasing growth, Okay. You know, uh, there is a time for driving organic growth and, uh, say, doing M&A add-ons, but typically those follow that, that period for us of intensive operational engagement, which is at the beginning. Thank you. Uh, one of the key transformation that the economy has been uh, um, uh, handling is tech transformation. And uh, at some time, we only had, you know, due diligence for, te for tax and legal, due diligence, accounting due diligence. Now, more and more, it's the tech that can drive the performance. <laughs> And so Adrian um, Ashley Jones, Intuitus Advisory, is a specialist of tech transformation and tech due diligence. Uh, can you tell us um, how the business has grown to help a private equity investor handle pre-deal but also post-deal tech transformation? Sure, yes, thank you. Um, nice to meet everyone today. Um, I think what we've seen over the last I guess three or four years, but definitely an acceleration in the last couple of years, is a trend um, to, to basically looking at diligence, tech and digital diligence on the buy side during the transaction through a different lens. So historically that lens has been more focused on downside risk, assessing um, you know, the, the currency, the fitness purpose of technology systems, infrastructure, people and processes. And that's now moved to a position whereby investors are now much more interested in not only understanding those fundamental downside risks of what is it I'm actually acquiring on day one, but trying to build into the diligence program before you acquire the asset um, a view on how does technology and digital really enable change once I've got ownership of this business over the next one, two, three, four, five years. So it's about during diligence trying to create value creation plans meaningful input into how technology will align to the overall investment thesis and will drive that change in the ownership period. Do you, can you give us an example to make it more crispy? Um, for example, you know, how much time do you invest in the, in the due diligence phase and, and also leading to a tech transformation? I don't know if you're allowed to, to mention one. Well, sure. I mean, I can give you a sort of a, a generic example, I guess. So, you know, the diligence engagements can be from anything from you know a week, four, five, six weeks, depending on the process, obviously, and the access and so on and so forth. I mean, clearly, it's a, it's a hugely competitive environment at the moment with, with a huge amount of dry powder and, and you know arguably fewer assets on the market. So, timescales in diligence can be often quite challenging. But but I guess typically 
we will we will spend you know in an ideal world three to four weeks in the diligence phase building out um, value creation plans transformation plans during that phase as well and that might well just be a, a relatively small team of, of maybe just two two people or, or, or maybe three or four on our team and that's that's variable depending on size of the asset whether it's a, a mid-market investment a lower mid-market investment or more of a global buyout uh, investment with some of the you know the larger global buyout and that's Advent, Apex, Carlisle, so on and so forth. Um, and then in the post-deal environment, it's very much a, a, um, a needs-driven requirement. So we would typically look at helping a client and, and clients will take the approach whereby they don't want to bite off too much before they can you know, run, before they can walk, so to speak. So we often start with incremental steps around what we call ideation. So helping a client really understand where the change needs to happen in the business, how that change is enabled by technology and, and um, digital, um, digital uh, programs. And, and ideation then really sort of rolls into what we would call the strategy piece. And that can be, again, three, four, five, six weeks long, relatively small spend. And out of that, we get to a position where we're working with the board and the investor to say, look, these are the, out these are the outputs. This is what the strategy is saying. There's probably two or three options you can take depending on how long you want to be engaged with that asset, asset what the ownership period is, whether you're going, for example, on a buy and build strategy, um, whether it's internationalization, so on and so forth. And then you get to the stage where it, you know, it's fundamental wide scale acceleration or change, whether that's back office change or acceleration of product. You could have teams of between you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, engineers at the, at, the, at the sort of larger example where you're actually helping clients develop new products roll out new products as part of their as part of their really their sort of outsourced team if you want to describe it like that sure last question before we turn to Gilles Colombin um, due diligence is also about a go no go um, uh, input um, out of 10 uh, do you take due diligence how many times do you have to red flag the company and say to your clients don't invest or low bid <laughs> I, I would say the time where I've, I've worked on around about, I don't know, 500 deals over the last you know, a lot of years across lots of sectors across Europe and North America. I can count on my hand, simple hand, the amount of times that the technology or digital element has been a red flag that stopped the deal. So it's, it's, it's very unusual. Um, however, has a technology or digital finding and diligence altered the the investors view of valuation valuation yeah or has it altered their view on um you know fundamentally what do we do with the asset shall we change our investment thesis yes of course it has so it's, it's very much the latter it's 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 very rarely a, a, a red flag situation where we say you know you need to walk away from this most things in technology can be can be fixed it's a question of your appetite for the change that you're going to have to go under Okay. And which could be significant, and the capex and opex that you might have to deploy to make that change. Got it. Thank you very much, Gilles. Up to you now. Um, you know, uh, Charter House is, is known to um, to to have aggressive transformation plan, especially uh, with buy and build strategy, which is one of your key playbook. Uh, do you want to comment on how you bring value to your companies, and is it your team or the management team that that drives that? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Pierre Antoine and Pierre Etienne. And um, nice to meet you all. So yes, Charters, what we, we tend to do is uh, we're clearly not a restructuring play, right? We, we, we always buy a very, very strong company. On average, EBITDA margin is more into 25%. So we, we are not, as some other company list here, working on situation where there is a transformation to be done to put the company back on track. It's very much to grow very good companies. So we, we, we tend to team up with uh, families, funders, management to take company to kind of a next level to usually we try to double the EBITDA. So buy and build is big. The world transformation is big. You know, sometimes it will be purely organic. And we've got cases where it's been frankly doubling EBITDA organically. Um, but very often it's, it's about buy and build. So the way we work on preparing the buy and build and then executing the buy and build is before acquisition first. Before acquisition, because we tend to do this partnership transaction where we team up with people, we, we, we do usually our deal outside of auction. Most of what we've been doing is actually bilateral. 
So with a very, very long lead time where we are talking to the previous owner about what we can do together. And during this time frame, this is where we're going to hire a consultant and do a lot ourselves as well and prepare a bit the shopping list. Mm -hmm. And then, if it does make sense, that will be one of the elements we will convince the current owner to sell, sell to us, and roll over massively with us, because this is also something we always want to see on a deal. And then we will go implementing the strategy alongside other of the value creation strategies that we will have put together during our onboarding phase, which is the first six months of ownership. The deal team will execute must have this acquisition. The management team will then execute more and more of that. Usually, we, we, it's very, very often the case that before or ownership, the management team has done less by unbuilt than during our ownership. So we try to uh, add more resource internally within the company, like head of m &L, things like this, to allow the management team to do all this acquisition on their own. But at the beginning, we will try to take as much of the workload possible on the deal team. And so we transfer gradually, depending as well on the size of this, uh, of this transformational acquisition. You know, there is a lot of buy and build, which will be pretty small, and some will be emotional. So clearly, different approach there. And then the portfolio team will be very much involved in the post-merger integration, as it will be on uh, other, other, other situation of the company. So we are kind of splitting the two uh, in, in this way. The both of the team at Charters is very much embedded into the investment team. So okay. they are really, really working together, but it's obviously a different skill set. About value creation, do you want to name an example? I don't know, maybe Mirion Technology or Optima Group, one where you, you think uh, Charterhouse uh, brought some value to your uh, portfolio company in terms of changing the scope, changing the, the opportunity. Yeah, sure. I think, you know, Clearly, um, on all of our portfolio companies, the portfolio team is very much involved to do that. Million that you mentioned is a good example. Million, so for those who don't know Million, it's a, a, the global leader in nuclear measurement. When we bought Million, it was very much focusing on nuclear power plant. And then we merged it with Canberra, which was at the time owned by Arriva. And then we created clearly the global leader we, we, we had some synergies in putting the two together and, uh, you know, both in terms of cell synergies and, uh, you know, uh, as well a bit of cost synergies, just having a better operation. And then we shifted a bit the focus, not really the focus, but we, we enlarged the focus of the firm to go into medical because nuclear rats measurement is not only in a nuclear plant, but it's in an hospital. A lot, okay. you know, being radiology, being radiotherapy. So then we've done six acquisitions in medical to help the company to broaden a bit its base and have different dynamic because we all know that nuclear plant is, uh, is a stable business, very long term. You've got very good visibility on CapEx because every, you know, project is very long. Well, obviously in medical, you've got much more growth. It's much more agile, much more you know, swift. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a good balance to have the two. And you're using, anyway, the same kind of core skills at the company. And um, all of you have been in the private equity uh, for a long time. And you know, a few years ago, uh, probably 10 years ago, we were speaking about 100-day plan. But it seems now the, the transformation you guys are bringing is more like a two-year plan or a full cycle plan. Uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the time frame of those transformation? Um, maybe uh, maybe uh, Gilles and uh, and then uh, Tristan. Yeah, sure. So uh, actually, for us, the hundred day plan does not really exist. Is the onboarding period is six months, so okay. it's uh, twice. Yeah, but it, the onboarding period is really when we set what we're going to do, not at all during the time frame of which we will be doing the value creation. If we talk about million, for example, we bought million five years ago. And we did a fairly sizable acquisition. You know, we are talking about 23 million EBITDA, which are uh, uh, almost $300 million um, on year five, just done in December. Okay. Because it makes a lot of sense. It was something we've been pursuing for quite some time. So we will not stop the value creation phases after a couple of years. Surely not. We, we really, because we do strongly believe that the next owner, when they will do the due diligence on the company, 
they will be able to value what we've done even the last week. Yeah. So even if uh, on the one hand, you're right to say, usually or 10 years ago, we were not putting too much follow on equity after the first two years because we were concerned that we will not get the return on this additional equity. I think now it's, it's not really that. I think you... private equity has been much more focusing on value creation than 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was much more about leveraging, deleveraging. So you need time to play with cash. Okay. Now it's much more about value creation. So, so you will sell to the next owner the latest that you've done on value creation. Would you say, would you go as far as to say you were focusing on EBITDA, meaning past uh, metrics, and now you're focused on DCF, meaning forward metrics? <laughs> when valuing a business, oh, uh, no, we, it, we, I, I hope we've always been focusing a lot on DCF because, you know, we've got, uh, there, is, there is something fantastic with private equity is that we've got time. Okay. On average, you know, not only we've got governance, but we've got time. Okay. So, um, but you're right, the key metrics when valuing a business still is a bit that, right? But we, we, we look forward much more, you're right. Okay. Tristan, maybe um, <laughs> from your pay book, uh, what, what do you think about the, the phase uh, to, to do the transformation, the timing of the transformation? Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with Gilles in the sense that it's, you know, it's, it's not um, sort of done and dusted and over. You know, when I think of one of our experiences, we bought a packaging group from Smurfit Kappa, and there was a period of time of standing the business alone, setting up standalone functions, rebranding it, I, I guess, you know, making an initial impact. But actually, you know, after that phase, we then moved, I guess, to more performance improvement, cap, you know, capex with payback periods and a series of operational projects. And, and as we did acquisitions that brought, you know, integration synergies that redoubled the amount of things we could do. And... In a way, we're on a sort of constant treadmill that, that actually could just go on and on and on. And so as we began to look to exit, we, you know, we looked to tell the tale of what we did, how we grew the earnings, I don't know, four or five times from when we bought it. But obviously a key ingredient for the next owner was, you know, the ability to continuously improve and that the capacity for change and improvement wasn't exhausted. So as well as setting a list of M&A targets, you know, for further consolidation, which is great, um, we also, you know, had some substantial, you know, one-off projects like, a, like, you know, combined heat and power projects, that sort of thing. And then we had a number of other, I guess, incremental projects that could be undertaken to drive further efficiency, further change, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Um, such that I guess if we didn't sell the business, we would just carry on doing them. But if we did, we would expect the, the new owner to really appreciate the capacity that, that great businesses have for continuous improvement and and, and therefore, for us, I think operational um, performance improvement is very inherent. In, in, and what we're looking for is the ability to constantly improve. Now, now clearly, you, you know, if you don't do any add-ons, of course, it's not, it's not infinite. Um, you know, you can't just keep automating and automating and automating. Um, you reach a point. But, but I think when you do add-ons and you enter new geographies and you develop new products and new offerings, there is the capacity and, and you know, always the opportunity to reevaluate and improve. But I, I'd say in summary, you know, we would expect to have the greatest impact in the first, say, two years. But it's, it doesn't sort of, it doesn't end then. And it's very much yeah. part of our DNA. So you stable a change plan for post-deal, post-exit <laughs> for the new owner. Yeah, yeah exactly. But well, I guess in terms of what, what turned us on was, was the operational potential. And obviously, we try and unleash a lot of that and, and, and capture it and, and try and improve the EBITDA significantly. But um, to believe, you know, you buy, you buy a, a facility, a series of sites, and you have absolutely, I guess, done everything you possibly could, you know, for, for, for many buyers that will not leave enough on the table for them. So, you know, it's very important to us that we leave um, enough potential for the next owner to do things. So, um, and, and I think it's inevitable. You don't always exit exactly when you want. You exit sometimes when the market is, is pressing you to exit. And, and, and I always think you shouldn't bank on exit being, you know, a certainty. And so we should just act as business as usual. We should continue with operational plans and keep driving them and every year drive them. And I guess, you know, if you, if you go around a factory and you speak to a, um, you know, a, a, a general manager, they will have a list of CapEx projects. You know, don't worry. They will never be satisfied they've done all the CapEx they'd like to do. Every year there will be new CapEx. And in the same way, you know, we will continuously, uh, I guess, consider ways to upgrade and improve and keep ahead. Okay, and Adrian, looking to the exit target, uh, you usually are being brought for the buy side, but on the vendor side, um, preparing for the exit, are you more and more, you know, you know, looked around to help uh, 
steer the next phase on a vendor tech uh, due diligence uh, approach? Ah, we can't hear you. Adrian? Sorry, um, yes, sorry about that. Um, yeah, aligned to my previous experience, there's definitely been a change that we're seeing in the market over the last couple of years where vendor diligence from a tech and digital point of view is, is more prevalent without a shadow of a doubt. And I think that's partly because the market in general is, is, is getting to grips with where tech fits within an asset and the strategic value it can add throughout the life cycle. So they're, they're trying to maintain more control by doing the vendor diligence on the tech before it goes to the market. Um, so, you know, I, it was definitely more of the vendor diligence being done in market. I think to Tristan's point, it's quite interesting. It's, you know, change is, is constant, for sure, within the portfolio companies that we see. And uh, the, around the vendor question, vendor diligence question, it's quite interesting because we will often get asked either on the, the vendor side or the buy side the question around, there's a major change in transformation program going on at the moment, and this business is going through a transaction. So the buyer may well ask us, or will inevitably will ask us, you know, how well thought through is that transformational change? It's going to run for another two or three years, potentially. It's going to be under our new ownership, you know, and we're being told that the CapEx and OpEx is set for, I don't know, I'm making it up, five million. You know, I want to know as a buyer coming into that business that it's going to be five million and it's going to take three years instead of it being four years and 10 million. You know, those are clearly would be fundamental changes which would affect valuation. So that would be on the buy side, but to your point on the sell side, we would answer that question from a sell side point of view by validating the change program, making sure it's in a good place and that the, the potential buyers coming in who are seeing that eventability are comfortable with the fact that the change is on track, is on plan, and isn't going to degrade any value. Got it, thanks. Um, you know, change is sometimes difficult to accept by the teams. Um, so how do you bring a sense of urgency, uh, especially in loss uh, making uh, situations, but also how do you go beyond denial and to resistance against change, especially in France, that's, that's where you're uh, operating, uh, Sebastian. So sense of urgency, how do you bring it and how do you go beyond denial um, with the teams? Uh, well, um, uh, first of all, uh, the motto we have at Alandia Industry is uh, take over, transform, and share. And what people have to understand is that I think we find a way to align uh, the, uh, what employees, what management team is expecting, and what we are expecting as an investor. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, it's very difficult to uh, buy well, transform well, and sell well. And so as an investor, what you want is uh, you want to think about making a good deal. You are thinking about uh, limiting uh, the risk you are taking when you are making an investment. And at the same time, you are thinking about mitigating your risk of failures. As uh, uh, Vincent was mentioning earlier, that's happened from time to time in our industry. So what we do at Alandia Industry is that we uh, share very early in the process our analysis of the situation. And we explain things as they are. It might not be very well received at the beginning, but at least it's a very strong and clear message. Usually everyone uh, receives it uh, the wrong way at the beginning, and with some pedagogy, they start understanding why they are in this situation. And it's it's kind of radical explain, candor. Radical, radical candor. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, that's the way it is. Uh, of course, it's not pleasant to hear, but that's the way it is. And uh, unless you prove me I'm wrong, uh, and unless we discuss about it, uh, I think the analysis is probably the right one. But then we explain that, of course, things will have to change. And people will have to change. And transformation will have to take place. That will obviously make people uncomfortable sometimes. Uh, but we explain that. Uh, the more we will ask, the more we will share. And by doing so, first of all, you put people on board because they realize that they just don't do it for you. They actually do it for them as well. And at the same time, you also uh, prepare for the success. You have um, the ability to reduce your risk. You have the ability to increase your chance of success because everyone is on board. And uh, you, you, you avoid this conflict of uh, 
uh, is it a sense of urgency or not? OK, he says there is a sense of urgency. Me, as an employee, I'm not convinced yet, but at least they offer me something in exchange. So let's move on. Let's try, and let's see uh, if we can succeed together. So share the diagnosis and also share the money. Yeah, share, share the exit, if there is an exit. Again, uh, uh, in our industry, uh, if you take a special situation deal in France, less than 10% has done a better return than standard private equity. Mm. So it means that the question is not making deal. Making deal is pretty easy. Buying is pretty easy. What is much more difficult is to succeed in buying well, transform well, and sell well. Okay. And that is pretty rare, actually. Vincent, how do you align interest and how do you go beyond denial? Um, you have to, you, you need to, to, uh, to get a, a great management. And that's what we are, have uh, achieved at, uh, at Verdozo. We have, uh, uh, out of our nine uh, portfolio companies, uh, uh, four uh, managers uh, who are uh, performing their third uh, uh, company with, uh, with us. So, so we have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, you know, managers uh, at all our companies uh, who uh, are totally aligned because they are partners uh, of, uh, of, the, of the company uh, and uh, they, ha they own shares. Uh, so they share, uh, of course, uh, the, the success. And this is very important to have this kind of uh, alignment. And then there are great managers, and, and they are uh, the ones who, are, who get you know, the, their people uh, motivated, who know how to uh, explain, design, uh, and, 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 and share with the, with the people the, the, the successes. We are not uh, uh, aligning uh, capitalistically uh, the, the, the employees, uh, but the, the top management. We prefer to uh, 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 provide uh, long-term incentive plans with the, with the employees and uh, uh, through bonuses. Uh, it's more a classic approach, uh, but um, yeah, sharing, aligning, uh, uh, being totally transparent, no politics. We are in SMEs, so you, can, you, you, you cannot have politics in the companies, and you do what you, uh, what you say and you say what you do. And, and these, uh, these are the, the, it's the management, uh, our manager's uh, duty, and they do it really well. So that's the way we, we, we manage it, and good managers. So great managers like the yeah. seed to hope and the seed to change. Yeah. Um, and, and when you hit like a resistance, um, what, what, what's the, uh, how do you go beyond the resistance? Uh, you change the management. <laughs> you change the top management. You, if the best, when, when things go wrong, and, and it has happened, when things go wrong, you, you have to, to sweep the, the stairs beginning from the top level. And that's what we have done. And, and you have to be very harsh on that. Uh, maybe turning... No, uh, complacency. The, no complacency. The, when, we, when we have failed, uh, or the, the, the failures we had, it's because we were complacent with lousy managers. Okay. You cannot be in this, uh, in this scheme. It's all about management yeah. or, or poor data. Uh, maybe to LBO funds, when the, when the change you know, is, is not taking place, uh, what's your playbook? Uh, when, the, when the program that you were supposed to deploy doesn't happen, uh, how do you step in and how do you try to unlock it? Christian? You know, of course, things do not go as planned. You know, I think um, in these sort of transformation cases, you, you know, you're kidding yourself if you think there's a business plan, you underwrite the plan, and it all just goes as planned. Um, so you need to expect the unexpected and be realistic that there's a range of possible outcomes. Um, and I guess by deploying um, a resource from day one, you're sort of ready for the uncertainty. And, you know, we've obviously, 12 months ago, we had massive uncertainty with the pandemic. No one had planned for it. But by having operational engagement, um, you know, you, you stabilize and, and you bring some certainty to an uncertain situation. So I think when, when things do go wrong, um, I think the thing is to not have a blame culture, um, but to try and really understand the facts uh, and, and, and assess, is this a market, is it a market issue or is it a company issue? Um, is it a temporary or is it a permanent? Um, is the answer capital or is it time? Um, and, and I guess our approach has, has usually been to, be, to be quite patient, you know, patient source of capital, um, because I think it's very easy to be, to be shocked and impatient and make, make a knee-jerk reaction. 
it is obviously very difficult when, when additional capital is needed. You can't just sort of sit and wait. Um, and then it obviously becomes a key question of do I, do I put, um, you know, do I double down or am I doubling up? You know, what exactly is this for? But so I think the main thing is, is, is you know, is, is it to be a fact-based approach to be intellectual in your evaluation, not too emotional, if possible. We, we all get it, obviously, emotional as well. Um, and to ultimately reflect on, you know, did we, did we understand everything fully when we, when we underwrote the deal? What has changed? Um, and, and I say, I mean, we're all very conscious, but we're dealing with people um, in these businesses, many, many stakeholders who rely on the businesses and customers, suppliers, employees, unions. Um, so there's an element of, of doing the right thing. And then there's always track record as well and the importance of, I guess, of, of managing the needs of our stakeholders, you know, the, the institutions who have, have enabled us to have this, this privileged role of supporting companies through these change programs. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we need to be, you know, we need to be rational and make informed decisions. Okay. Um, and as I say, you know, we do manage risk. That is, our, that is our business. It is risk capital. And in some case, being patient. You mentioned patient mindset. Uh, Gilles, maybe on your side, uh, what's, the, what's the Charterhouse playbook on when there's a bump on the road or a tsunami like uh, the healthcare situation last year? The, the mic? Sorry, yeah, it works now. Um, so we were all, I think, um, expecting some kind of recession before uh, COVID last year. Surely we were not expected to happen. <laughs> and uh, that certainly may be positive is now the risk of recession is much lower. But um, what, what we've done last year, very simple, I think it is what has been said already. It's all about communication. It's all about being there in real time. So what we were doing is having all our people available to help on everything, the management team that we had in some cases, you know, could be a very, uh, very specific, you know, I can think about uh, a company where we help building an home delivery platform to help, you know, our uh, company selling to their customers for them to be able to sell to their customer because it's a mm -hmm. B2B2. And in some other cases, it was obviously the cash management is the first thing that you do as a sponsor because you've got more regular relationship with lenders. So that's something you, you start doing and you take that off, you know, the shoulders of your management team. I think what maybe was the most interesting, if we look back now, is the ability of private equity owned company to be ready for the restart because there is more people around the company. So the main issues are identified. They may not be fixed, but they are identified and there is a plan. And so you can start working on what's going to be the restart. How will you gain market share when it's going to restart? What shall you do even during really uh, the most difficult time of the crisis uh, to protect the value chain of the wool industry? What shall you do with your customer? What shall you do with your suppliers to ensure that they will stay in business? Yeah, And I think that's maybe one of the key lessons learned uh, during this crisis is uh, every GP we've been talking to acted exactly the same, not only protecting the company they are invested in, but protecting the whole you know, ecosystem to make sure that you can restart early. Because we all know it's not a financial crisis, it's an operational crisis, and it's going to restart. Hmm. You need to be ready to, uh, to, to, for that. Maybe um, turning to all of the panelists, um, one lesson, one key lesson, one key insight that you learned from the crisis. Uh, you all have uh, 10 years of, 20 years of uh, experience, but what was the one lesson you took away from 2020? Uh, maybe Sebastian? Well, for me, there is one lesson is uh, sell at the right time or sell <laughs> when you can. Because um, I have a good friend of mine who told me, you guys are pretty crazy. You spend your time waiting for the right elephant. And when you find it, you still believe you have to keep it. And uh, I have some good friends in our industry who have not sold, uh, who wait one more year to drive maybe one percentage more of ABDA. And I think uh, the, the key lesson is what Tristan said. When you want to sell, sell. Even if there is value to give to the acquirer, to the buyer, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So leave money on the table for the buyer. Yeah, and, and sell when you can. And don't fall in love with the company. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, Vincent? Um, I think the, the adaptability of the, the, the companies and the management teams uh, has been uh, really amazing. And uh, 
they have proven uh, 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 something that is interesting is that they have made fixed cost variable costs and it was very interesting <laughs> and this was how to preserve profitability so what looks fixed is not necessarily fixed and that's what they proved this year so okay they have to continue <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe uh, adrian one lesson uh, uh, from 2020 that you want to carry forward yeah sure i, I would echo the comments there that has been made actually it's, it's it's quite a generic point but um I think it comes down to the quality of the management and their experience and how you build your team around those key leaders. Um, because undoubtedly the last 12 months has been a very difficult time in terms of you know, making sure revenues are maintained, the operational wheels are turning, but also maintaining employee well-being and you know, working from home constantly, the challenges of that, so on and so forth. So I think having Having a great team around you before such events happen, whether they are, you know, COVID-related events or other macro events or just industry events that you've got to deal with, uh, you cannot, um, you know, you can't get away from the value from having great people in a, in a company. That's going to help you get through lots of really bad times if they come along. Long inside. Thanks. Tristan, one, one line insights uh, that you take from 2020. Christian, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I said I think it's the value of having operational resource in in the portfolio companies. It's incredibly invaluable to have that capability to to support in unknown circumstances. So to help, help uh, uh, put, put hands to the pump and really stabilize difficult situations. Thanks. And last but not least, uh, Gilles, one. Uh, one, two, one lesson from 2020? Yeah, I think it will be exactly the same is how much people have been joined up, meaning management and us investors, but also the whole uh, ecosystem. I think we uh, lenders did behave extremely well. They reacted extremely fast and been totally joined up with equity owners, with management team. And uh, that, that was really a, a situation where everybody was aligned with one goal, make sure that this company will go through this crisis. One, one question for you. You have the IR hat. You, you're in charge of uh, investor relationship. Were, were they nerv nervous with your investments and the leverage on top of your investments? H how did you handle the LP, you know, um, you know fears? So we, uh, we reduced our leverage on our investment massively in the past 15 years. Okay. So uh, almost half of what it was. So we don't have much leverage because we want to keep the cash, you know, available for growth. So we, we, we didn't have any situation which was pretty bad. Now, what we've done with investors is a lot of communication. So communication. Make sure that, they, yeah, it, it was extremely important. I think uh, that what LPs, investors, really um, were looking for is to make sure they will know. So when we do at call usually every six months and we were doing at call much more regularly to ensure that uh, our key investors will, will, will know, sending a lot of information and going with a you know, green, yellow, red card for everything, explaining where we are, what we do. And frankly, investors were not nervous. Okay. So and and very, very quickly they've been able to see that the portfolio will be doing well and, uh, and the portfolio actually so far has been doing well. So uh, uh, let's hope we don't have a, a, a second winter of uh, COVID <laughs> next year. And uh, it's going to be all right. <laughs> Hopefully not with five vaccine now. But um, so <laughs> my, 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 my takeaway is, um, you know, 10 years ago, f uh, private equity was about finance. And I think this panel demonstrate that it's more and more about ops, 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 and also strategic changes. And, uh, and that the value is driven not from leverage, but from communication, from implementing um, operational change and strategic change. And um, so I guess um, in five year time, I will suggest, uh, you know, maybe an Excel, you know, add on to the panel so that you guys keep up with finance because you guys are geared more and more to, towards ops. Um, and that's, that's a great transformation for private equity uh, that has happened over the last, uh, I guess, 10 years. Uh, on that note, thank you very much for sharing your insights. Um, and thank you to the public for um, attending uh, the panel online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.